Okay, in this particular video we're going to look at working with numbers and specifically we're going to do an introduction to forecasting. Where we're going to start is by trying to predict the future based on history as well as guesstimates. And the guesstimates are based on government data, facts, and basic information, whereas the history is typically based on prior patterns for the particular products and or services that we are selling. Forecasting involves both qualitative and quantitative techniques. Qualitative techniques often involve uh, people, small groups of people, experts, uh, consumers, etc. And quantitative techniques involve often mathematical estimates uh, such as weighted averages as well as regression analysis. most common type of forecast is a sales forecast, which is a prediction of future events. Specifically, we're looking at revenue and also we're looking at how that revenue in fact impacts our cost of production in terms of units, either units of produ products that are made or units in terms of services delivered. So it may be how long does it take to complete a tax return, how long does it take to um, file a brief for a lawyer, etc. Sales forecasting is used to measure, it's used to manage, and it's used to control. I'm talking about measurement, we're talking about really trying to understand what kind of revenue we're going to have and then being looking and seeing how accurate our predictions were. And this gives us a good sense and a feel for um, any return on investment as well as um, great feedback into uh, the overall process of assessing our risks for the future. Management involves operations. We need to know sales forecasts so that we can convert that into the appropriate amount of resource, um, whether it's a uh, production related resource or whether it's human related resource or capital for that matter that allows us to convert um, inputs into more valued outputs. It also helps us from a finance point of view so that we can um, anticipate our future expenditures as well as our future income. And then finally from a control point of view sales forecasts are often used from a compensation point of view um, to uh, reward or recognize people that have uh, successfully uh, driven the sales forecasts. So how do we develop a basic forecast? Well we start with something tangible. For example we might ask ourselves how many men's gold watches can we sell in the UK? And we might know a few basic facts, such as the fact that there are about 30 million men who live in the United Kingdom between England, Scotland, and Wales. We also may know that the approximate cost of the watch is about $100. And so we want to develop a sales forecast based on this data. Well, we're going to look at a couple of different approaches. The um, first approach is that we're going to uh, start with some assumptions. Let's say we want to make $200 per watch in margin. So therefore, our selling price needs to be $300. Let's say we're going to sell these watches through retail stores and that they want to make $300 per watch. Therefore, their selling price is $600. We may also assume that 50% of the men in the UK are too young, they're under the age of 25, to probably buy the watch, and that only 5% of the men in the UK are actually wealthy enough to buy a $600 watch. So therefore, 5% of the 30 million represents about 1.5 million people in the UK that could potentially buy the watch. We may also assume that we can get a 5% share of the market in year 3 and that will have a 1% market penetration in year 1 and a 3% market penetration in year 2. These are all fair assumptions. If we put this together in Excel, we'd realize that in year 1 the 1% share that we're shooting for, the 1.5 million um, potential buyers of $600 watches uh, represents about 15,000 units and that our revenue would be about 4.5 million. In year two, a 3% share would be 45,000 revenue of 13.5 million and in year three 75,000 and a revenue of 22.5 million. So does this look attractive? Well I think for many of us it would look quite attractive especially those year three numbers. But the question is, did we did our approach to forecasting, was it actually a good approach? So let's look at a second approach. We might, instead of saying we want to make X amount of dollars per unit, let's start by asking how big is the market for $600 men's gold watches in the UK? 
we would then base our forecast on market research. We'd establish our objectives. We'd determine the data sources and the approach that we want to use, quantitative, qualitative. We'd design the research, collect the data, analyze the data, and then report the results. Some issues, um, there may be lack of clarity in terms of the actual objectives that we're trying to shoot for or lack of agreement. We may um, depend heavily on secondary or qualitative data. Uh, we may not use it initially. We may use only primary data. We may not implement things properly. We may also induce some kind of bias, especially uh, in any surveys or data gathering attempts that we make, or even just the selection of sources that we use. We may make errors when we tabulate it or misinterpret the data. We may also produce some results that, quite honestly, our stakeholders or shareholders or investors don't want to hear. And so that may lead to um, some awkward moments and also some adjustments to the forecast that are um, you know, fraught with potential error. Let's talk about data sources for a second. So once you've decided to go down the market research thing, area, then what you want to do is you do want to come up with um, both primary and secondary sources of data. Your primary sources of data will often be um, some kind of consumer research where, where you will survey, hopefully, statistically um, sizable uh, samples of uh, the target market population. In this case, it would be you know, probably several hundred men from that 1.5 million men that you've identified um, who have the means, the wealth, to be able to buy $600 watches. So you would uh, have to get a market research firm or people within your organization to put together a good, valid, and reliable survey and then to actually go ahead and do it and make sure that it is statistically significant in order to have meaningful and useful data. If you want to use secondary data, then you look for good sources such as market research firms, the government, associations, and magazines. And from that you may learn certain facts and figures that give you a sense and a feel for the magnitude of the opportunity. If we use the Bureau of Economic Analysis, um, they say that uh, for the category jewelry and watches in the U.S. it's 62.6 billion dollars. MarketResearch.com identified a category that was called similarly jewelry and watches for the UK is a 4.3 billion dollar market opportunity. Um, the, there's several issues, um, just to touch on a few. We don't know exactly if these categories are identical or if they're different. Um, we don't know whether this is the retail value or the wholesale value. Um, we don't really have a good feel for the accuracy of all this information. So we might also then go to a qualitative source or qualitative sources and ask some industry experts, people that have been involved in the industry for a long enough period of time so that they can give us a good sense and a feel for which data seems to be the most accurate and what is the overall reality of the situation. What we're looking for in this case is usually the size of the market. And it's usually not a good idea to depend on one or two sources, but instead at least three sources. And we're trying to have a feel. Is the market in the UK for this category of watches a 10,000 unit per year market? Is it a 100,000 unit per year? Is it a million unit per year market? We simply don't know. But it's important for us to try to get a sense and a feel of the magnitude so that we can do the best job possible on estimating uh, the size of the market potential and this will help us to manage our risk appropriately. We may also gather some other data such as uh, in this case the LGI network is a, uh, a um, online resource if you will for luxury goods and so this may give us a good good sense and a feel for uh, as the third data point of the overall market opportunity and once we get these different data sources then we attempt to try to carry this out and figure out okay even if it's the US Bureau of Economic Analysis and it's not going to give us the perfect information for the UK at least we can make some assumptions or or um, decisions that the US demographic and psychographic profile is close enough to the UK such that it's decent information also the economic levels in other words the amount of money that people have to spend is similar enough so that at least it gives us a feel for the magnitude so if we do some calculations based on this then it may allow us to um, make some determinations about the actual UK market for men's 600 
uh, dollar watches. I should say dollar, not uh, euro. And so from that, um, if we look at the different data, we might come up with a uh, market size of about 53,000, 52,918 watches sold in the 500 to 799 dollar 99 cents uh, category in the UK in 2005. And so once we've done this market research approach, it'd be nice to go back and compare it to our previous forecast and then make some decisions about which we believe. Before we do that, let's make some further assumptions so that we can line up our, our forecast, our estimates, um, in a very good comparison. Uh, remember, we said that we wanted to assume that we can get a 5% share of the market in year three, and that will have 1% market penetration in year one and 3% in year two. Well, using the market research-based forecast, uh, the number of units that we estimate will, will sell in year one is 529 with a revenue of 150 nine thousand dollars in year two it's about 1.6 or 1600 units with an estimated revenue of 476 thousand and in year three it's about uh, 2600 um, units with an annual revenue of about 794 thousand dollars so let's take a look and see how this market research based um, comparison compares to the prior assumption based um, a forecast. Well, you can see right up front that the market research based one is considerably lower and maybe a lot less attractive. So remember that's a revenue figure, it's not our actual net income or contribution margin figure. So which set of data do you have the most confidence in is really the key question. And what you should probably answer is the data that is tied to the different sources of information, in other words, the market research based data, we have more confidence in. It doesn't mean it's giving us the best answer because we'd sure love to have 15,000 un units a year that we could sell instead of 529, but from a confidence point of view, um, I have a lot more confidence in the market research based data, um, provided all my calculations, etc. The, the things that we're concerned about are done properly. Um, and uh, Therefore, you know, that's the one that I would recommend using. It's more, it tends to be more well thought out. It's based on known information from viable industry sources and uh, therefore uh, should give you a better estimate of the magnitude and size of the opportunity. So if we break all this down and, and then we, let's say we get into the market and uh, we then want to and we use that data from the first year and we still decide to go after the business, maybe it's a small side business or maybe it's a, a business that you feel has good long-term potential, um, and, or maybe it's a, another product category for a small business that opens up new revenue sources. And you can see by year three, it's about 800,000 in revenue. So it's starting to look like a pretty attractive um, product category for a small business. Um, let's say you go ahead and do that and that your forecast is year 1, 529, year 2, 1587, year 3, 2646. Well, the next thing to do is to look at your actual and then to uh, determine what a reasonable forecast would be for the next three years. And if you're consistently coming up with numbers that are below your forecast, then it's reasonable to assume that you're going to make an adjustment down, uh, downward on your uh, future forecast. Another thing to kind of take a look at too is to look at the estimate estimated forecast amount of revenue um, versus the actual and then look at the actual in terms of uh, units sold to come up with your average selling price. What you might find is that in year one you had a had to apply a fairly healthy discount, year two an even deeper discount to maybe drive volume growth in year three you actually didn't have to discount much at all. So something clearly happened. Actually, you didn't, you didn't discount. What you did instead in year three is you're actually able to bump up prices and you made more money. So it's um, interesting to look at um, you know, the data once the patterns are established 
um, especially the actual data because that will help you in terms of revising your forecast. So if the pink line represents our forecasted values and the yellow represents our actual values, well then we would use the actual data to revise our forecast based on the trends, the actual trends that have taken place. We still might show growth, we may even show um, growth above what this forecast shows, but usually we would tie some kind of expenses to it or some kind of unique event that uh, drove that growth up higher or in a, moved it in a different pattern or increased it more substantially than, than planned. And from a financial point of view, we'd do the same kind of thing. We'd look at the um, actual and we'd look at patterns and trends in order to um, help feed that in. Our ultimate goal is accuracy. Um, one of the primary reasons for it, in addition to predicting future cash flows, is also having the right staffing and resources in place. Um, you know, whether it's uh, simply having enough uh, inventory available to convert into your finished goods, or whether it's uh, have enough people around to apply labor to whatever it is that they're trying to produce, or to uh, delivering the service that needs to be delivered. Um, you don't want to be constantly scrambling. You want to do the best job you can on predicting the future so that you can manage those resources appropriately and therefore realize the kind of uh, margins that you're looking for. So we're looking for predictability. We're looking for stability. And we're also looking for an increased ability to manage risk and ultimately profitability. And it affects our operations and, ca and financial uh, cash flow, as I said. So other notes, contribution margin is often an output contribution margin is equal to revenue minus the variable cost, where variable cost is equal to direct labor and direct material costs. And this is really touching on what I just said, that you want to have a pretty good feel for how much money you're going to have left over from your sales based on the per unit costs of labor and material that go into producing those products and or services. So contribution margin is effectively the cash left over after direct costs for making the product or delivering the service have been accounted for. So some other techniques that you can use in forecasting, there's the Delphi or expert opinion technique, uh, which is judgment often used to establish preliminary forecasts or validate approaches. There's moving averages, simply using the average of a prior period of time to predict the future. And there's regression where you use different environmental factors that appear to impact the future as a determinant of the forecast. Some final comments, start simple, use both primary and secondary sources for market research. Make adjustments to the model based on actual results. Use your judgment and the judgment of other experts to refine the forecasting model. And keep refining your, your model using different techniques to see if they fit the historic data. Finally, state all your assumptions and also know how you have put the numbers together. In other words, identify all your sources and make sure your calculations are sound.